Yeah, it's A. Welcome to Little Chase. Tomorrow, November 8th, is election day. Recently, we had the honor and privilege to interview both the Navajo Nation presidential candidates. This video is the interview with Dr. Boo Nigren, and I hope that you find it informative. Um, I hope that it gives you insight into a Navajo leader, a potential president. And regardless of who you voted for, I hope that these two interviews can give you a sense of faith and optimism in both of our candidates. Um, but if not, at least find these videos informative. Share these videos with your friends and family. Like, comment, subscribe, and let's get started. much for sitting down with us to do this interview and uh, give you uh, opportunity just really quick to introduce yourself. No, Antonio, thanks for giving me the opportunity to sit here with you and really discuss some of the challenges and the upcoming election and everything around the Navajo Nation elections. I am Dr. Boo Nigren, um, red running into the water people clan, born for South Vietnamese people. My maternal grandfather is uh, bitter water people and then my paternal grandfathers are South Vietnamese people. Grew up in uh, Red Mesa area and spent my whole life there. Single, my mom was a single mom. She battled her struggles with alcoholism, recently lost her two years ago. And just the everyday struggles of a lot of our people, that's kind of what I was raised in, even though I am a young candidate, I'm not in my 70s. I know that the story that I tell a lot of our elders, they always say, well, I grew up like that, but I'm like, but yeah, that I'm glad. and there's still people like the way I grew up. So that's what I'm excited to run for Navajo Nation president is the way I grew up, our grandparents grew up. Those are some of the same circumstances. A lot of little ones are growing up and whatever I can do in the capacity of the Navajo Nation president level, that's what I'm gonna tackle on. And I'm also married to a state representative, Blackwater Nigren, and she's my wife. She's We have a little girl together and she's our leader in her own right. She's gotten a lot of things done. I think that's what young leadership brings to the table. So definitely excited for this election. And then my running mate is Rochelle Montoya, who's also a mother. She's a, she's a professional worker. She's a local leader. And her husband's an army veteran. So I think our campaign, I always tell people, it represents the everyday Navajo people. We bring to the table the basic struggles of what it means to live in the urban areas and to try to make your way back home or we understand what it's like to be back on the Navajo Nation to understand those struggles. So that's what our campaign about is about. And my hope is that the Navajo people do come out and vote by the masses because just the way I speak in a lot of the forums or the debates or a lot of my rallies, it comes from passion because every day I visit people at the flea markets, at the laundromats, the gas stations, where it might be, and they're just so disinterested in how our government works. Some of them tell me straight up, I'm not gonna vote because I don't believe in our government. I don't, I don't have any faith in our government or they tell us it's the same rhetoric. So what I challenge them to do is give a, 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 a newer leader a chance because I've prepared myself. I've worked off the Navajo Nation over a decade. I've worked on the Navajo Nation. I understand what it takes to work and collaborate and make things happen and I think, I think that's, the main thing I bring to the table is I'm a working person and that's what's needed at the president's level. So you have a construction background. Um, mm -hmm. That was your major in, mm -hmm. uh, at, at ASU. I'm wondering, because you spoke about home site leases mm -hmm. and the process takes years mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, why, why is that the case? One of the things that I've said on my campaign trail is You've got people that can get a home site lease in one month, or you got people that it takes two decades to get a home site lease. So I know there's a possibility to try to get home site leases done within six months. The way you get it done, one of the things that it's really needed on Navajo is we need more surveying companies. If there's not enough Navajo businesses that have surveying companies, why not establish that internally? Because every project that we have across the Navajo Nation, we need surveys and we need archeological reports. And then when it comes down to right-of-ways, those are the things that is required by professional services. And on Navajo, we don't have that internally or the current Navajo businesses, they're at capacity. So we've got to start building those capacities because that's one of the things I thought about when the ARPA dollars that were recently allocated, a lot of them are not ready to be built in two years because that's what we have. We have two years to try to get those projects built. 
A lot of them don't have right-of-ways. A lot of them are not surveyed. The arcs are not done. So to get water mass transmission water lines surveyed, art designed, and everything done in two years, it's it's going to take a miracle to do it. So that's something that I'm going to have to inherit if I become the next Navajo Nation president. Is how do we pri reprioritize what can actually get done? Because the Navajo Nation has a big track record over eight years, four years of sending money back. And that's what it's going to take is a very proactive approach and knowing where the things are not going to happen. So when I, when I think of home, right of ways, because most home site, the reason why you get a home site lease is you're trying to build a home. And then in order to have a home, you need water and you need power. And so in order to get any water or power, a lot of those projects need right of ways. And some of them, they get hicked up in the Navajo Nation government to where no one's going to have the right resources to try to get those done. I think those are the things that go hand in hand, right of ways to get water lines, electric. And then uh, when it comes to home site leases, really just need your survey plots. And that's what is really missing on Navajo is survey plots and arcs because those things can cost up to $1,000 per report. And most people don't have $1,000 laying around. And that's where I've, I've set it on the trail. Hey, let's do six months and let's see if we can do that stuff internally as your next president so people can have, because right now a lot of ARPA dollars are requiring home site leases. And if you can't get a home site lease or if somebody's not gonna grant you home site lease because they don't like you, you're kind of out of luck. And that's one of the things I want to focus on is when somebody is trying to request basic needs for water, power, and broadband, we should be able to help them because they, they need them right away. You said something really, really interesting in the debate about withdrawing land. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm assuming you're speaking about grazing rights. Uh, so can you, can you speak a little bit more about why you said, said that? that? When I said withdrawing land, because a lot of the larger communities, whether it's Shibrock, Fort Defiance, or Tuba City, or Kenyenta, or Crown Point, a lot, of, a lot of those larger communities already have some sort of infrastructure in there. And then a, the reason why I said that is that's where some of the jobs are. So when you can withdraw maybe 20 acres or 30 acres and let's spring water, power, and electricity and fiber to those areas to where if someone wants to buy a home and they can use a one, one, HUD 184 loan, at least there's water, power, electricity because a lot of the, those loans require that. If that's not there and then you start having people invest and have equity and things like that to where they, if they decide to leave Shibrock or if they decide to leave Crown Point, they can sell it, they can put it up for sale. So that's where I said, let's start with drawing lands to where working people can start investing in those communities because when a lot of us who have worked off the Navajo Nation, some of us really like the amenities of being in a bigger community. And then uh, when it comes to the rural areas, you just gotta go through the same process as far as getting your own home site lease. But I think if we withdraw some land and start developing and having people invest in it and buy, buy into it, then I think that's gonna, that's gonna bring a lot of people to come home, even withdraw lands for apartment complexes too. Because across Navajo, there's not, you can get employment, but there might not be a place to live or you might get tired of living with mom and dad because you're like, ah, I need my own space. So those are the reasons why I said, let's withdraw land, but let's be fair to the landowners. Let's be fair and let's make sure we take care of them as well. Cause I know that it's grazing. Most people kind of say they don't own the land. It's the government's land, but we should honor them because they've been there for hundreds and hundreds of years because their clans have been there and stewards of that land. So why not repay them and make sure that we compensate them correctly because we're gonna develop housing, develop apartment complexes, retail, whatever it may take. I'm really glad you got to explain that a little more because um, when you said it in the beginning, I'm thinking that we're gonna withdraw land across the board um, and the amount of money it would take to do that would be enormous. But if we're talking about 20 acres, like a strategic mm -hmm. locations, locations in larger large. communities, I think that is much more viable. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I also want to speak a little about, about zoning and, and mixed use because typically in American cities, you see single use zoning where you have um, single family homes and then you have your business commercial center, you have your office spaces, everything is separated. Um, and uh, I feel like the better way to develop a society is to integrate those uses so people don't have to be as dependent on their cars um, so you can be able to walk to your office. You're actually walking to your rally after this, um, this interview. So 
what, what are your thoughts about mixed use? I think zoning and planning is something that the nation really needs to work on along with building codes. Because right now, across the Navajo Nation, we don't have our own building codes. We don't have our own inspectors. We don't have our own planning department and zoning department to enforce. And that's what's really missing across the Navajo Nation because we rely so much on third party organizations out of Phoenix and Albuquerque to do what all the what most cities typically do. So we got to stop outsourcing and start doing it on our own, whether it's at the at the at the um, the local government level, whether you're LGA certified or your township or your certified chapter, you should have some of those abilities because right now we don't. Because if you wanted to build a home on Navajo, there's no standards that you, somebody can come out and inspect your house, inspect your plumbing, inspect your foundation and things like that. So as president, those are some of the things I'm going to focus on is really bring the basic things that we take for granted in the larger metropolitan or city areas that they're doing. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can just adopt a lot of the things that they're doing right now. That So that's what's great about, I think, us not having what we need now is Let's adopt the best practices available across America to make it more efficient, more effective, because land is very scarce on Navajo. We might have so much land, but that 20, 30 acres or 40 acres we might withdraw. We're going to have to be strategic. We're going to have to make sure there's retail, there's, there's community centers, there's parks, there's housing, there's all sorts of things that need to be involved in that because it's gonna. It's one chance. To bring you're gonna bring infrastructure, water, and fiber into those areas, and why not utilize that to the best practice? And that's where the center of that hub could be, like an agency uh, agency building, because one of the things that is needed across Navajo is people are tired of going to Window Rock for everything. Why can't we bring those services to the agency level, to Shiprock, to Kayenta, to Tuba City, those areas that are people instead of going from I don't know, uh, Navajo Mountain all the way to Windrock. You could just go to Kienta or you could go out to Tuba City. So things like that, that's what uh, the main focus is because we can't spread out. It's gonna, we're going to have to either withdraw some land and start building up and figure out how we can all coexist in those areas. Yeah, so I, I appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, I'm also wondering about single use or single family homes um, and with Navajo's it seems like it's more intergenerational living. Mm -hmm. um, definitely sometimes people don't want to live with their parents, but mm -hmm. um, there is definitely a value to the grandparents being there with the parents, with the, mm -hmm. the grandchildren. Um, and uh, I guess, would you support housing policies that allow for more density and more multifamily housing? I think so. I would support it because it's needed because everybody's, there should be options for both because there's families that want to have their own space. They want their own acre, they want space, they don't want to see their neighbors as they look out the window or hear them upstairs. So I think that we got to have those options, but there's a, the, like what I'm talking about right now is when it comes to housing, it's probably median income to high income housing. But when it comes to low income housing, when it comes to NHA, which they're supposed to be on top of with uh, low income housing, we got to be, we got to get, we got to start pumping houses out because our population is growing at a really high rate and we're not keeping pace with housing for low income. And the dollars are coming in and dollars are being sent back. So as president, that's gonna be one of my main initiatives is sit down with the organizations at B, whether it's low income, median income, high income. Because right now, what doesn't exist is what we're talking about, median to high income for working people. But what exists now is low income and they're getting 60 million to 75 million dollars a year. How do we build on top of that? Because those are like the free housing, the NHA developments. And even within that, we got to start making sure that we're keeping them accountable because right now they're they need direction. They need leadership. So I'm not going to go out and blame NHA. It's just you need leadership from the top to set the pace. Yeah, I feel like we could talk about housing all day. Um, I, I do want to move on to other questions, though. So you spoke before about your mom um, passing away from, from alcohol and just thinking about policies that affect the way people interact with alcohol mm -hmm. on the Navajo Nation. I've been curious about um, what, what, what would it look like to legalize alcohol and to use that, to tax it and then use that tax revenue to uh, invest in mental health mm -hmm. facilities and behavioral health and substance abuse. 
Yeah, so I think as president, that might be one of the first referendums that we work on, is that we got to put that before the people because a lot of the people are asking that same question. It's not me asking, it's the people out there that are asking that same fundamental question about why we should put it before the people and say, hey, is, is this going to be, let's vote on it. Do we want out to legalize alcohol on the Navajo Nation? But they need to use those taxes generated to be reinvested in the communities directly to develop preventative services like detox centers to make sure that if somebody does go to jail, that there's corrective actions to where they can, there's counselors, there's therapists, there's mental health professionals that really guide them. So right now we keep them for eight hours and they, we have, they have to leave because we don't have services that will, will keep them staying longer. So I think if, the Navajo people vote for that and we use those dollars, then why not use that? Because that's kind of how I feel like with my mom, there wasn't a lot of services available to where she could help herself or where she could talk to somebody, where she could pull herself up and work on herself. There's just not a lot of opportunities. And that also leads to jobs and opportunity on Navajo. Because right now, people that the majority of the people that live on Navajo don't have a job. They can't provide for their kids. They can't buy groceries. They have to, they feel embarrassed to go use food stamp or welfare, or they have to resort to other means and they just can't provide. So, but if there was jobs and opportunities for people to help themselves or a place to live or a play, an opportunity that they can make something of themselves, then I think that we could really address that. But right now it's just, it's just status quo and we're not taking strides to, to really develop things that we need every day to make our hearts feel good, to make our minds feel like we have purpose. So you've said in the past, um, the line voting is sacred. And I think that comes from a place of acknowledging how our voices matter. Um, but on the same, in the same note, I think there's been controversy with that statement. And uh, personally, I don't know if I agree with that. I know that voting is important. Um, people really need to vote. I, I believe in democracy, um, but I'm not so sure about that line, like voting is sacred. So I, I wanted to ask you to help convince me otherwise. I, can you expand on why, um, why you believe that? I think voting in general, you could use important, sacred, holy, whatever it may be. It's just voting, you have to vote. If you don't vote, then you're stuck with leadership that's gonna treat you the way you're treated now. So every four years, every two years, whenever you have that opportunity, it's the one time that you can make your voice heard to actually make a difference, to make a difference on who leads you, who talks for you, who advocates on your behalf. To me, I think that's, if you wanna use sacred or important or whatever the word is, but all it means is you gotta get out and vote because you're gonna be in the same boat if you don't vote and your voice is not gonna be heard. So I think that's whatever, per, whatever words you prefer on voting, but what's important is you go out and vote. So I don't have a preference on what we call it, but just to go out and vote. I, yeah, I'm just thinking because the word sacred, it, it means more than important. It's like a connection to God or mm -hmm. to the holy people. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just, it's something that has like, it, it's more weight to it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. that, that, that was my thought behind it. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't uh, I think that's what kind of just came to my heart at the moment in time because I feel it every single day as I talk with people and I tell them, this is your opportunity to make a difference. It might not seem like a lot. It might seem like you're just going in there and you're, you're voting for someone, but you're voting for someone that is gonna advocate for you. If you want that person to be that person that you think is gonna represent who you are, this is the, na the time and place because if not, you're stuck with the same. And I think that there's no other time and place where we keep our leaders accountable because it's, uh, yeah. And that's just kind of how I think about it. Thank you. Um, uh, your name is Boo, Dr. Boo Van Nigren. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you have um, had some complications with uh, the mixed race aspect of you. And my name is Antonio Ramirez. Uh, I grew up pronouncing it Antonio Ramirez because I've just been raised as Navajo and Hopi. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, how have you navigated that in the, uh, in the candidacy for presidency? Because I know when you were vice president, you mentioned that it was the first time you experienced racism. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm just wondering, wondering yeah, what, what's it been like for you? 
I think a lot of people have gotten past it because it's how I speak, where my heart is. But I know that initially, a couple of years back, people were thrown off. They were very um, unaware of where that name came from or whether I was even Navajo. So I think that this campaign, it's people understand that I grew up here. I, we all have different names. As you mentioned, your name is of a different ethnic, ethnic background. There's other people that have German names, Swedish names, whatever kind of names that we have today. I feel like there's no true Navajo name, unless you get, um, there are some people that have Navajo first names, but uh, I, I think that it's very rare for someone to have a Navajo first name, Navajo last name. And I think that's something that we've all accepted that is it's changing times. It's a, a new place in time for our people to develop. And I think just even hurdling the primaries was a big one. I think that 13,000 people were gun ho about we need leadership. We need leadership today because leadership doesn't, the right leadership doesn't have the right name. The right leadership doesn't look a certain way, but as long as their heart, their mind, and their soul and their effort is gonna be about serving the people, that's what they want. And I felt like that was truly heard in the primaries because some people thought, no, with that name, you're not hurdling the primaries. And I think that we came out pretty strong, so. That's great. Um, what, nationally, there's been conversation about defunding the police. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know what your thoughts are on that. I think on Navajo Nation, it needs to be funded because we are very, very underfunded. I think that um, the nas nationally, they should look at what's going on with our police officers and how they're so under-resourced, under everything across the Navajo. If you've, talk to a police officer on the Navajo Nation right now, they're going to tell you, we don't, I, I'm serving the size of the city of Phoenix with a ton of people and it, I can't keep up with it. And I think that I know that sometimes we want to look at national things, but let's stay focused on things happening back home because right now back home, we don't have enough. With, uh, do you have any opinions on abandoning uranium mines on how we can fix that as, or how you can fix it as president? I think, as I mentioned in two, on Tuesday, um, I brought up the fact that we have over a billion dollars that's sitting in a bank to try to clean that up. And it's been sitting there for over 12 years. And that's what I've brought up to my opponent. You were the budget and finance chair, you were the vice president, and you were the president. What have you done? The money's there and the shovels have it, the groundbreaking hasn't happened. And, and that billion dollars is not going to clean up as much as it, it would have 12 years ago because all of us know how much inflation has really skyrocketed over the past 12 years. To me, while we're sitting here and not doing anything, it's costing us money. So as president, the money's there. Let's get out there and let's start cleaning because the, the time and need for planning, I think 12 years of planning, we should have at least cleaned up one site and we haven't cleaned up one site in 12 years. So, so this is, um, an election season and a lot of people come at it thinking, what is the president going to do for me? Um, but I think when we're only asking that question, we can lose a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm wondering what is something that we can do for, for the president? What's something that we can do for our nation to get engaged? I think the best way to engage and be a part of the change is to vote in leadership that is willing to work hard, to willing to do the work that needs to be done because some of the work that needs to be done is gonna take leaders with heart and compassion that's willing to work with the president because as a president, you're only as good as how well council will work with you. If council is not in the, in the same mindset or the same place as you are, then it's gonna be uphill battle and just makes it a little bit more difficult. So I would advise the people out there that are going to the polls also, not only just think about the president, but think about who you're voting for at a council level. Think about, do they, have, do they know what they're doing? Number two, do they have compassion and commitment to serve the people? And number three, are they willing to put their differences aside for the greater good and work together with the judicial branch and the executive branch to get things done? So, so after the election, um, there's a lot of people who wanna make a difference, who wanna, wanna be involved. What, what's advice you have for them, especially for young people? I think for young people, it's, it's gonna be once we get there and we have that authority is to really, meet with departments, meet with uh, the organizations that be with the, with the division directors, because sometimes they necessarily don't understand things that need to happen, but there's also other ways to get involved because there's nonprofits. 
that are always trying to partner with the Navajo Nation or work with the Navajo Nation. So there's no one specific answer because everybody likes different colors, I guess you could say. Everybody wants to do something different. So whatever that difference is, is you just got to speak up and sit down with the right people and try to whatever your path. Because I wish I wish there was an ex because there's people that want to build houses. There's people that want to bring healthier foods. There's people that want to help raise livestock. There's people that want to save our language. Whatever the case is, you got to bring it to leadership and really have leadership give an honest answer. I think a lot of them just want an honest answer. What, what do we need to do to get it done? And I think over the past years and years, we just don't have a, a solid tracking system because we don't know who comes to the Navajo Nation on a daily basis. We don't know what they're there for, but using technology and using uh, information technology, we should start tracking why people come to government. Like we should know who showed up at the chapter house today and what their needs are. We don't know. I wish, and that's where we should make sure that every chapter house across the Navajo Nation. Now with Starlink, there's no excuse that every chapter should have high speed internet. So I think that if we had that type of service at every chapter house, we would know especially even within the divisions or departments and things like that. And that would really gauge us on where to really make things happen. And then, and I think that's where it's, I think it's just continued feedback from the people to make sure that they're not shy about speaking out and talking to government. Great, I'm just gonna ask a few more questions and we'll go ahead and close it up. Um, but climate action. So there are three major sectors with uh, food and agriculture transportation and generating electricity. And if we can decarbonize those three major sectors, we can deal with almost two thirds of the entire problem. So as president of the Navajo Nation, can you speak about one or all of those categories? Uh, maybe just one. Um, can you speak about one of those categories that you see a way for us to move forward in reducing our carbon emissions? When I think of Navajo, I think about, again, no offense to anybody, but the basic needs, poverty, the basic needs of water, electricity, power, how to pay for things. Right now, I think the majority of the Navajo people, they don't have farming. All the dams are broken. Look, look at many farms. They're no longer a farming community. You look at, um, there's no generating station. There's no mines on the Navajo Nation. There's no, none of those things. And I think that as president, I got to stay focused on what's relevant to the Navajo Nation. I get it, the outside community, just being here in the metropolitan area, look at how many vehicles are emitting carbon dioxide right now as they're driving around. I think that's where those issues are prevalent and they matter, but you don't have a city like Phoenix on the Navajo Nation. So as president, I got to stay focused on the basic needs and the fundamental changes that need to happen on the Navajo Nation. Maybe if, maybe if we do the right planning, 50 years down the road, that we don't have to ask that question. Like I said earlier, we already know what's wrong with Phoenix. They don't have water. It's, uh, they're running out of land. They're running out of space. They're running out of everything. So us as a nation, let's learn from communities that have already been built out and not use, use those mistakes as ways we can build our communities. So I think as president, that's what we've got to focus on is just focus on I wish we had those problems probably. <laughs> then we probably have a lot of jobs. We probably have people that have apartments, parks, community centers, and places to go watch a movie. And to, there was enough police officers. There was enough first responders. There was nice big hospitals, veterans hospitals, VAs. I think that if we had that problem, I think that, that would be interesting. But right now it's just, how do I get to tomorrow? That's a lot of the basic challenges of our people. So just thinking some food for thought, um, you mentioned getting a landfill program developed. Um, and so when we, when we do that, part of it is also doing about, thinking about waste diversion, because a lot of the, the, when food gets into the landfill, it doesn't get oxygen, and that chemical decomposition process mm -hmm. releases a lot of methane, which um, is, a, it's much worse than uh, than uh, carbon dioxide in terms of climate change. Um, so are there, can you speak a little bit about your ideas behind those programs um, with, uh, with the landfill? I think when it comes to landfill, we just need one regardless of it. Cause right now it's everywhere. 
I think if you've crisscrossed Navajo land, if you've met families, they got trash everywhere. So right now it's not organized. It's not even being centralized to where it's uh, being managed or taken care of. So regardless if it's a really efficient landfill, like the one, uh, I think it's in uh, south of Gallup near Bread Springs. It's won a ton of awards. We should meet with experts like that, that really know landfill, or we just try to figure out how do we get a landfill? Because right now, if we don't manage it as a government, where does it go in our backyards? I'd rather have trash be consolidated to where we have some control as a government. And right now we have no control because it's either you, you, the plan is I want a Tesla vehicle that's electric and all the power that's fueling my Tesla is solar and wind. Most people just want to be able to get in a vehicle and put gas in and get where they need to get. So I think that right now in the Navajo Nation, we just straight up need a landfill. We need a landfill and hopefully we can design it to some standards that's very similar to the one in near Bread Springs. So, and, and I look forward to touring that facility too, because I've, I've mentioned that I'm gonna tour that landfill because I've been told they've won a lot of awards and it's right by Gallup and there's no reason to try to have one similar, I think a Navajo person started that company. So looking forward to sitting with that person and hopefully we can get something like that going because right now it's better to do something than nothing, so. Right, so in terms of climate action, that, that's not one of your priorities, it seems like, right? No, because I feel like the basic needs of our people need to be covered first. So this isn't a basic need, um, but it is uh, looking beyond survival. You have the Diné Marriage Act that prohibits same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. um, would you support repealing that act or um, are you still on the fence about that? I think my response hasn't been on the fence. My response has always been, we need to put it before the people and the people should decide upon it. And then that way, no one can point the finger. It's what the people wanted. And I think it's a fair thing when it comes to changing fundamental things on Navajo, whether it's fundamental law or fundamental policies that affect all Navajo people, the Navajo people should have a say in it. So as president, if that referendum, or we should totally put it before the Navajo people, because I think for far too long, we've talked about that, about that scenario and it's been approved a few times. I think one time in 2005, it was, approved and then it was overwritten by the council but i think it's about time we put it before the people last thing um legacy what type of legacy do you want to leave behind and what do you want people to say about you after you um your president and your term has ended i think the one thing i've always said is we haven't changed fundamental things on Navajo because for far too long, we focus on the nice stuff. A good example I think about is every four years, we build a new house. The paint's good, the windows are good, the roof is good, uh, the flooring looks great. A month later, the concrete is cracking, the drywall is cracking, the windows breaking and all sorts of stuff because we haven't made fundamental changes so that we have a strong foundation I hope that my legacy is Boo was at the beginning when we made fundamental changes that we can stand on and build on. Instead of building a brand new house every four years, let's build a strong foundation. And from there, we don't have to keep re replacing the drywall, replacing the windows. We're actually starting to think about the big things that some of the things that you've mentioned today you know, to get out of survival mode, I guess you could say is that would be my legacy. It doesn't sound like a big thing, but that's something that no leader has really focused on because they love looking at what kind of paint should we choose? What kind of light fixture, you know what I mean? <laughs> Let's make fundamental changes that will impact the future of the Navajo Nation. So that's, I think would be my legacy is Boo went into the fields of the hard, the, the rowdy roads and the tough roads and he got it fixed. And then now we can build on top of that. Well, thank you so much for your time. Oh, I need help. Hey, <laughs> hey thank you, sir. Yeah. Appreciate it. That was fun. That was really fun. Yeah.